Um, if you have a Bible, First John chapter 4 is where we are. And you may be thinking, oh, not necessarily the greatest Christmas text of First John. Uh, and yet, I think you'll discover maybe indeed it is. There's a literary device that's used in plays, movies, uh, books, novels, and that is story within a story. And what we're doing during Advent, these four Sundays leading up to Christmas, is we're looking at the stories within the stories. And last week, it was the story of the wise men. That's a that's a, uh, an interesting little group of guys, who knows, two, four of them, six of them, have no idea how many, not even positive where they're from. The only thing you know for sure about the wise men, non-Jewish. That's why there's usually a holiday, it's the first week of January, that recognizes the wise men, because the birth of Jesus was not just for the Jewish people, it's for the world. And that was a big message sent by those wise men. That's really probably the only thing we know, the value of their gifts they brought, um, their faithfulness to listening to God. Uh, but it was the message to the world that Jesus is for the world. Today's story within a story is the story of this concept of a gift. This idea of a gift. I wrote about it for this coming Wednesday devotional. If you don't get my devotional that goes out on Wednesday mornings, you can uh, send me a note or write it on that little perforated. Just put your email address and I'll uh, make sure that you're added. But Wednesday morning, dropped into email boxes, will be a little bit about this idea of a gift. Because it's mentioned more than once that Jesus is referred to as a gift. We have Mary and Joseph in the standard story. That's the main thing. But then you have these other things going on, plates being spun around the story that we could learn a lot from. We're going to learn about a gift and what is exactly a gift, what's, the, what's involved with it, and learning more about who Jesus is. If you have your Bible and it's looking at 1 John chapter 4, 1 John 4 starts in verse 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And Heavenly Father, please give us some insight. Your Holy Spirit, speak to each of us on this passage. So maybe we could appreciate even greater this wonderful gift that you've given us in Jesus. Amen. How do you measure the value of a gift? It's a little trickier than it sounds because some of the greatest gifts you'll receive have no monetary value whatsoever. It might be sentimental value. It might be monetary value as well. It might be its usefulness. Is it actually going to do me any good? And sometimes not. Jewelry. Not a lot of usefulness, necessarily. Unless your jewelry is a fountain pen, by the way. That's jewelry you can use. So I don't know how you value it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at with us those few verses and look at some of the values of a gift. Look at the very first one. It says in verse 9, in this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. All of a sudden now, all of a sudden now, this gift of Jesus is not this abstract idea that is reserved for a Sunday morning in stained glass, of which we have the nicest stained glass in town, 
It's more than that. It's actually a gift sent His Son specifically so that we might live through Him. We might live through Him. We have life through Him. We're looking for life, uh, life, abundance of life. Life, fulfillment. We are literally in the pursuit of that every day of our life. The guy who has never been to church in his entire life, was never raised in it, so you don't blame him. It's not part of his Sunday morning. It's getting ready for football, or it's going out with friends, or sleeping in, or working in the garage. That person is still doing the same thing that we're doing, which is, how do I find fulfillment in life? Where's the abundance? So you could have this guy, I always refer to him as Joe Sixpack, just your average cool guy in town who's never maybe been to church in his entire life, maybe not even that well educated. He made his way through technically, maybe officially he made it through, but not even that educated. That person, if you sit down and just talk for a minute, will discover he actually is living his life in the pursuit of fulfillment. You go, oh, that's too deep. No, it's not too deep. Why does he choose to do certain things over other things? Or there's two options competing. Oh, that's revealing that all of a sudden, me and you that value fellowship in here, that's a value to you. It's, a, it's up high. That's a big deal. No problem until something else pops up and competes with it. Which one wins? Oh, that's, that's actually deep. Which one wins? On the occasional, sure, if it's, if it's tickets to watch our favorite football team play on a Sunday morning, yeah, they can pull that off now and then. Notice I didn't even say what the team was. Do you notice that? I'm not even going to mention the team. But let's say theoretically, absolutely. But if that's the choice every week, time with family, well, that's a high goal. Why is it you pick time with family over and over and over to the detriment of fellowship at a church? Well, there's a reason for that. Because you believe I am more fulfilled, I have more... Uh, contentment, abundance in living by focusing here than here. Why else would we do it? You say, well, but it's just obligation. Yes, that you think fulfilling your obligations bring more fulfillment than something else. So it's not even that you necessarily enjoy it, like time with family. Isn't it best somewhat limited? Yeah, I mean, you know, you can't, you can't miss a family member if they're with you. So, you know, a little distance isn't a bad idea, but you think, you know, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and take this weight so the guy who does nothing but work, I, he just works all the time, and it's kind of the Archie Bunker character who works and works and works and works, and you say, well, there's no abundance in light. No, talk to him and discover that he believes that life is providing for family, and he's fulfilling it. To the detriment of himself, because he has a concern to take care of himself, which is competing with a concern to provide for family, which one wins? provides for family to the detriment of his own health. We discover what is it we're relying on in our lives for abundance of life. So we could go around and say what it is, and it's Sunday morning, so we'll get a lot of the right answer. Oh, it's Jesus. He's the best, right? He's just so great. And we'll all write that down. We'll go, okay, I love that. That's, that's a good answer. 
but now let's just sit down and look at last week. Let's just look at your week. No, let's sit and look at a calendar and let's fill in as much as we can remember of what we did all week. And based on that, I'll tell you what your value is and where you think abundance of life is. Is that fun? (laughs) And we find out that Jesus is nowhere in it. Not Jesus, nobody. Nobody by the name of Jesus is anywhere in the week. And we go, okay, that's okay, but have it in your mind. Understand that you're living, thinking one thing, and you're not living that way. It's not to catch you. It's not to catch us. It's to reveal the depths of our heart, where is abundance of life? Where's it come from? I've always said, one of the worst things to say to our kids is, I'm always going to be there for you. That is, a, that is not a healthy thing to say. Because you will not always be there for them. When they were hurt, when you died early, and now they have the rest of their life without you. Well, your mantra was always, I'm going to always be there for you. Because you think, as I think, family's it. Family's the value. Family is where abundance of life and fulfillment is. That is not true. It's not true. In itself, it is not true. And we would say, thank God it's not true. Because somebody ruined your family. Somebody literally went in and broke up your family. And if the message was deep down that family is the answer, and I'll do anything for family because family's where all of my joy and contentment, if that's you, you're setting yourself and others up for a horrible emptiness and loneliness that isn't going to be filled. So you can go right down the line. Money? There are so many in this room can testify to having lost either a lot or all of their money in a very short period of time. I was talking to somebody recently. It, it's so much timing it's of when you sold the house. You, you have to sell it at the wrong time, you just lost a fortune. You sold it at the right time, You just made some, it comes and goes and fulfillment in life, the less that we think that's going to fulfill us, the better. Because it comes and goes. It comes and goes. And our health, is that abundance of life? (laughs) Some of the happiest people in the world are in wheelchairs. I I listen to NPR. That is my way in keep in touch with the world. And there, if you want to get frustrated in life, listen to NPR. It doesn't take long. But they, were, they had a, a study on it. It was like really revealing. It was like revelation to them. So it was this high-end study, and it was an interview, and it was the subject of whether, what brings joy, fulfillment, and contentment in life. And they interviewed countless people, and they discovered that the one who has no financial concern, completely physically healthy, in a, an amazing house, there is no correlation between happiness and contentment in that one and the one that is in a studio apartment in a, uh, in a wheelchair. That, that they literally were saying it that way. There's no connection. They found as many happy people renting and barely making it week to week, can't get out of their house, and the one that's in the mansion. They said there's no connection. We have devastated and we have suicide at this side. We have it over here too. We have real great happiness over here, but we had really good happiness here. 
They literally, it was like an aha moment on NPR where they're like, so it has nothing to do with money. <laughs> We're going, we know that. Do we know that? Do we know that? On paper, absolutely. We'll say money doesn't bring happiness. I had a friend, uh, Dave Musselman, who used to say, oh yeah, money doesn't bring happiness, but he sure makes your sorrow very comfortable. <laughs> I get it. That's funny. I see it. John 3.16, it was read for us by the Rainers, gave his son Jesus Christ for everlasting life. 1 John 4, 9, God sent his son into the world so that we might live. Romans 6, 23, wages or the payment of our sin is death, but the free gift of God is it's eternal life. Don't think, oh, it means this is life for when I die, I have eternal life. So, because God came, or sent Jesus Christ, God came, died my faith in Him, therefore, when I die, I go to heaven. Did you see what you just skipped? That's not what the text says. I have faith in Jesus Christ. He brings me life for when I die, I get to go to heaven. You see what you missed? You missed between now and when I die. Yeah, it's going to be horrible till then. How I eat a bowl of worms. My life, it's the testimony night where they say, I came to know Jesus and ever since then, my family left me. I lost my job. I lost all my money. Praise the Lord. No, that's what they're doing. Philosophically, they have substituted. They think that Jesus came to bring life, especially when we add the word eternal life. We think, oh, that's heaven. Yes, it is, but not limited to. Jesus Christ came to bring me and to bring you an abundance of life everlasting, non ending abundance of living today, right now, in your circumstance, and you're facing upcoming treatments, and you and I are facing now a life completely different, totally different than you ever expected it to be, several notches down in your view of what it was supposed to be. This wasn't how it was scripted. What do I do? Jesus Christ came to bring you abundance of life exactly the way you are and where you are in your circumstances today. Is that great news? That's the gift. That's the gift of abundance of life. Gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. You can't get more practically useful the gift of Jesus than the fact that we have the abundance of eternal life. Take a look at this passage again, because it says it twice, just in these verses alone. It says, verse 9 again, that God sent His Son, started in the middle there, God sent His only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life. Have In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son. So twice we have, it's I sent my Son, my Son. There isn't, typical little kid question, where's Mom? We have God the Father, we have a Son, where's Mom? Son is a figure of speech, which means heir, it's cut from the same cloth. You have a father, and then you have the son, which has the same traits. So much the same traits that when they say to Jesus, no one's seen the father, he goes, yeah, well, that's true, but if you've seen me, you've seen the father. <laughs> We're cut from the same. We are, in essence, the very same. That's what son means. He literally took himself 
not as an expression as Jesus, but as also a totally, in essence, different member of the Trinity, personality. There's three completely different personalities. And Jesus, as heir, as cut exactly same cloth as God is God the Father, and gave him. It's costly. Think about that. He took on the form of a body. He still has it. We often think past tense. Look what he did for us. Oh, it's past tense. It was horrible. It was terrible what happened to him. When he came out of the grave, he came out with a glorified body, which is the same kind of body you and I will have, faith in Jesus Christ, when we are resurrected with a glorified body. He still has it. He wasn't able to say, whew, I'm glad that's over. Let me go back to the way I was. No, it's a new, it's new. Do you ever think of that? Past tense? Costly? Yep. And future? He has a body. I don't understand the glorified body, but if you look at post-resurrection, the things he was doing, we study those not just to realize what Jesus is facing, we actually study that so that we know what our bodies are going to be capable of after the resurrection. So he ate. Oh, so you must actually, you could feel him just like this. His body is this. So they felt his hands. But then he wanted, showed up in a room that was locked, Right? And everyone goes, ooh, somehow there's something else about this body. People say, erroneously, it's a spiritual body, right? Because it's a new glorified spiritual body. Somehow we think spiritual is opposite of physical. So they think his body is spiritual but no longer has a physicality to it. Not true. Hasn't ever been taught in the Christian church that way from the very beginning. The physicalness of Jesus' resurrected body is as critical as the fact that he was resurrected. The same body that went in came out glorified. It's costly. It's different now for good. So we had, our kids are grown. I can't believe our kids are grown. Youngest is 21. Um, fortunately, he still acts young. So oldest is, what's Grant now? 26 or 27? I know, it's honestly, oh no, I don't mean it. It changes every year, it seems. <laughs> it does. So what do we decide? Okay. We decided we'll call him. <laughs> now, I'll bring it up real quick. Hey, how you doing? How's, how's your job? How old are you? You know, that kind of thing. Just slip it in there, and then we'll find out uh, what it is. So if you want to play with a kid, let's just, this is theoretical. But you get a little kid, and ideally, you don't say, come on into my office and sit him down in a, uh, like a wingback chair, and you sit across from him and say, well, hello, how, how are you doing? And they're sitting there going, okay, I'm good, weird. And then you say, oh, I'm reading Tertullian today. Would you like to read some of the Tertullian with me? It's an old church father. And the kid goes, I want my mom really bad right now. <laughs> this isn't working. So, right? So that is taking a kid and bringing him up to us. That's never been the plan with God through Jesus. The plan has always been Him come to us. He's always come to us. He's always come to us. The tabernacle in the Old Testament, it's the dwelling. He tabernacled. That's the word. He tabernacled among us. 
He came to dwell in the center. And when Jesus Christ came, he came to and he wanted to dwell among us, right? In Revelation, finally, when that new Jerusalem, now he dwells with us. The cost of Jesus Christ is not that he saved us so we can all go live with him someday. It was always, has always been, and it's theologically consistent that he has chosen to come dwell with us where you are. You wake up tomorrow morning, that's where he wants, he wants to be right there while you're pounding down your Fruit Loops because he wants to sit with you. He wants to be with you, dwell with you. So much so, he took on the form of a person permanently took on the form of a person so that he could dwell with you. You can't get more costly than that. The last one is that it's a, the gift is effective. It did what it was supposed to do. Take a look what I mean by this. And it's the end of verse 11. As beloved, if God so loved us, as we just saw that he came to bring life, propitiation for sin, sent his son, then we also ought to love one another. If he did this, this gift, then we do this. If he's been so kind, so loving, this. So when there's somebody who's, this is probably theoretical, let's say there's somebody who's really annoying to you. Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. You just looked at someone. (laughs) What was weird was that she was turning her head to look at you at the very same moment. That is great. They just, they deserve one another right there. That is mother-daughter relationship going on right there in front of us. The rest of us knew not to look. We're like, are they staring at me? Because I really want to look at them right now. I really, they're driving me crazy. The one who annoys you. That's when we stop and say, this is a person for whom Christ died. This, this Christ died for this person. All this costliness was for them. And I've gotten to the end of my rope after this much because they're annoying or because they took money from me, <clears throat> hurt my family. Really, that's the, so that's our standard. I'm going to write them off because they did this to me. When... Jesus said, oh, no, I love you to the end. That's what, how he handles them, which is why then we, fully understanding that, will say, oh, okay, <clears throat> they did hurt me, but I want to treat them, I want to treat them like it didn't happen. I, I'm going to love them. Oh, I may not trust them, right? That would be unwise. I'm going to limit business actions, maybe with them now. I'm not stupid. I'm supposed to be wise. But as far as the way I treat them and my attitude and love, that's why it says God sent his son that we would have life through him in this love. He loved God, but rather, not that we love God, but he loved us, sent his son to be propitiation for sin. That's satisfied wrath. That's what that word means. He satisfied the wrath of God. Jesus did. And if God so loved us, we ought to love everybody. Oh, you love them that much? It costs you that for them? Can understand that Jesus did a lot. For me, I'm kind of special. But them? Yeah, he loves them that much also. So then we love others. Uh, Gifts gifts generally um, have a purpose. 
Um, we had a coffee maker for a long time that when you poured it, it always just leaked down the side of it. And so I got as much coffee on the counter as I did in my coffee cup. Am I the only one annoyed by that? And I'm like, and I literally would say it every time. I'd say, the carafe has one responsibility. That's it. All I'm asking is get it from there to, that's all I want, and it's failing. A toaster basically has one responsibility, make toast. That's all we're asking. You see this process, what Jesus has done for us. It plays itself out. It's part of the story. He loved us so much that he satisfied the wrath of God. He loves us so much that he's giving us the abundance of life. And if that's true, well, of course we're going to love each other. See, it flows. We literally had that in the book of Titus, if you remember. The grace of God so overwhelms us. Remember the illustration? The, we are so like a sponge. We're so soaked in with the grace of God. If that's true, if it's true, when you walk, grace is coming out of you. If it's true. If grace isn't coming out of you, grace isn't in you. You haven't received it from Jesus. It's the same thing. His love was so great, he's given us such a wonderful abundance of life, and now money and family, everything fits into its category. But love of God in abundance, Augustine said the old famous saying that you have a God-shaped hole in your heart. So you can put anything you want in there. It's not fitting, but it's a God-shaped hole. Your heart is complete and full in Him only. And then everything else takes its place. If that's true, then we love others. Then we love others. If it's not true, don't just work at it. <laughs> I've got to love people more. No, don't work at it. You can't fake being full of grace. You can't fake being filled with the love of God. If you can't do it, it's because it's not in you. If it's not in you, you haven't received it as a gift from our Heavenly Father. What are some of the greatest gifts you've received? Have you received any great, like, growing up, I got an air hockey table growing up. Oh, uh, see. He said he had a silver cross pen. He got graduation, high school, and he lost it years ago. And I'm like, I've got a few. So I gave him a cross, silver cross pen. I know, that was nice of me. <laughs> out, of the abundance, out of the abundance of cross pens that I have. So, so um, What's like a great gift that you remember that you got? Is there a great one that, not, maybe not value, maybe it is value. What? My wife just got me an electronic scoreboard. An electronic what? Scoreboard. Like mistakes that you make in the house. <laughs> he got an electronic scoreboard. So you know that you, she gets more points than you. You know how that works, right? Oh, yeah, you get a timeout. Oh, yeah, this sounds really good. This is like a marriage, turn into a marriage conference, uh, a scoreboard. A lot of ladies are going, I never thought of that. I didn't know I could actually do that. So uh, what, for what game? Uh, basketball and soccer. Oh, I see. Sit on a field? Is it sit on the? Yep. Self-standing. Wow. You're amazing. <laughs> Look at that. Did you pick it out? No. Okay. How many of you? Pick out your own Christmas gifts. Let me see your hand. Okay. 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 No, good for you. Let me ask this. If you pick them out, how many of you pick out and wrap your own Christmas gifts? Now, come on. Be honest. Wow. Really? No, no, no. You'd be the next one. How many of you get it, wrap it, and are very proud of it? There it is. Okay. There you go. Um, 
I found a, um, a gift, a uh, definition of a gift. If you're not giving it willingly, it's not a gift. If there is an expectation of something in return, it's not a gift. Okay? So that's actually definition. A gift is not given, a gift not given willingly, or it's with expectation of something in return. Then it's called a bribe. <laughs> uh, it's payment. It's an incentive. Well, let's go to the scoreboard. You didn't expect anything in return, did you? No? Oh, oh. Okay. This hasn't turned into marriage counseling. This is leading to marriage counseling. <laughs> This is going to be some one-on-one -on -one stuff going. She's like, uh-uh. He's like, oh, yeah. So we're going to let that go. So I found on a website, uh, it's a law office uh, website, uh, Agar and St. John, if you care. It says, uh, legitimate gifts. This is like legal, legalese. Legitimate gifts are given as gestures of appreciation, goodwill, or to celebrate an occasion, without an expectation of personal gain or favors in return. So over and over, Jesus Christ is referred to as a gift. So if you feel unworthy in your hands, you're like, like the dirty little kid on the street, and you don't clean up, don't clean up, because that's the point. You can't. Not on your own, you can't. You take it. And go behind the gift, the giver is not saying, good, now you got to get cleaned up. No, that's, that's expectations. It's a gift. Because he's so confident that the gift of Jesus Christ, when received by faith, when that gift shows up in your life, it's alive. It changes us. That God-shaped hole is plugged, and it works through you, and it's going to produce a more loving person. It's going to produce change. It's going to produce within you uh, a dissatisfaction in things that you used to love to do. It changes us. You'll start enjoying things that you didn't enjoy before. Don't make yourself do it, because that wasn't the expectation. I just gave it to you. But it's so valuable, it's so costly, that as you receive it, it's alive in you. It brings you the abundance of life. So have you received the gift of eternal life? Because that's like probably the only catch. It's not a catch. Gift could be sitting there, but unless you grab it. Unless you receive it, it's not yours. Literally sitting across from an assistant, she was retiring. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was 20 years ago. She's sitting there. She's all happy that she's retiring. I'm sad. She was amazing. Her name's Scarlett Cray. And she had a little, it was in a Mickey Mouse box, was sitting on her lap. And she said, uh, she goes, I've loved working for you, went through all that, and I love you too, and it's amazing. And she says, I have something for you. And I'm already embarrassed. And I'm like, I'm not leaving, am I? <laughs> and she hands me the Mickey Mouse box, and I still, I remember taking it from her hands and opening it as her great-grandfather's sterling silver Waterman fountain pen. And you say, uh, no, it's a $1,000 pen today. It's spectacular. And I just sat there. I'm like, really? And she had this beautiful smile on her face. And she goes, it's yours. There are no strings. There's no expectation. But it's mine. When Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and then resurrected, it was over. He did it. The gift 
is here. And just because you know about the gift or can explain the gift or know people who have received the gift, it's not yours until you receive it. I want you to know for sure before you leave today that you have received the gift of the abundance of life. Propitiation, satisfied God's wrath with your, against your sin, that you have faith in Jesus Christ and the gift is yours. And for those of us that do, and that's alive in us, can we use this season somehow to just tell people not be annoyed by everything going on and not be this higher than that I can't believe they... No, it's love. That person is one for whom Christ died and I'm going to love them because I want them to receive the gift of eternal life as well. Will you pray with me right now? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed it's just to this moment it was just this quietness right now of this moment that if you've never received Jesus Christ that gift of eternal life you can right now just between you and God you can just pray to him heavenly father thank you for Jesus thank you for dying for me and loving me I trust you for my eternal life my abundance of life and no one looking around and you say, Pastor, I prayed that with you. I haven't prayed it before. I prayed with you right now and received the gift of eternal life with no one looking. Just lift your hand up so I can see it. I can thank the Lord for you, and you can put it right back down again. Yep, thank you. Good for you. And just right back down again. Greatest gift in the world. Changes everything. That's how I'll look one more time. Heavenly Father, thank you for... Jesus and the gift, thank you for the abundance of life that we really do have as we allow you to have your reign within us. Give us opportunity to share Jesus with others, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.